now we are moving on to the second technical session of the day for the second uh, technical session of the day we are having with us dr harini santanam assistant professor energy environment and cc program national institute of advanced studies with us i would like to brief about uh, dr harini santanam ma'am's uh, profile dr harini santanam is an assistant professor with the school of natural sciences and engineering at the national institute of advanced studies bangalore she investigates multiple aspects of coastal lagoons and lakes including the biogeochemistry hydrogeological processes and land water human nexus from an ecosystem perspective she has been a long term researcher with iisc bangalore working in multidisciplinary teams with a focus on analytical and modeling techniques with implications towards influencing management measures for the resource base she has led an investigation of the geochemistry of pulicat lake as the principal investigator of a dst funded women scientist project at uh, 2015-2018 at iisc she was awarded the national doctor fellowship from aict india 2004 to 2008 and had completed her doctoral research from anna university chennai her research interests are largely multidisciplinary bringing together the insights from so, uh, stochiochemistry integrative modeling paleoecological reconstructions development and applications of novel proxies and indices further she investigates the challenges towards sustainable development of lacustrine environments and models lake land interactions from the perspective of blue green infrastructure development and nature based solutions for enhancing the salience She has several publications in national and international journals, book chapters, and conferences to her credit in these fields of research. Dr. Harini is a member of the Commission of Commission for Ecosystem Management (IUCN) and collaborates with networks looking at socio-ecological interactions, vulnerability analysis, and resilience development of ecosystems. Her recent research on sustainability of aquatic ecosystems contributed to the production of useful science and technology policies for management of these ecosystems. She has been significantly contributing to the study on the use of fishery advisors providing key insights for sustainable development of the marine ecosystems of India. Further, she is personally investigating the impacts of anthropogenic pollution on the ocean and the coastal seas at multiple scales. Another area of her interest includes the study of urban water environments and the challenges faced in context of several risks, the mechanism of transactions, transitions, as well as the policies to provide for effective strategies for mitigation. Through her research and the teaching activities, Dr. Harini wishes to provide insights for establishing policy frameworks for achieving multiple targets of sustainable development goals. The floor is yours, ma'am. We are eagerly waiting for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks for that generous introduction. Uh, first of all, a very happy World Water Day to everybody. I hope you can um, listen to me. Am I clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And uh, thanks, special thanks to uh, Dr. Inba Kandan to invite me for this uh, uh, very prestigious faculty development program. Um, also, thanks to Satya Bhama University, Dr. Sheila Rani, for having me here today. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I. sitting through the first few sessions it's been a great experience till now to listen to so many experts from different multidisciplinary aspects of water and i'm going to share some aspects from my own uh, so i'm just going to go ahead and share my uh, presentation I hope this is visible to everybody. Yes, yes sir. We can. Thank you. So let me begin. Um, as I was introduced, um, I'm part of this very important um, organization, um, NIAS, National Institute of Advanced Studies, as well as part of a very important network globally, the IUCN. um so it's it's very important that we look at these things from different aspects uh, being not only a researcher here at these institutions as part of also being part of a network 
i am also very um, fortunate to gain so many perspectives on this so one thing that uh, the, it gels with the theme for to this year's um, world water day of un is the 2020 groundwater which uh, the theme very well uh, recognized theme is to make what is invisible visible and uh, going with that i thought of giving a very important title to this talk and i ended up when i thought about it uh, i ended up with this title the inheritance tax because what bothered me was what we were inheriting as human beings from the environment and as human beings to the environment so we are having inheritance and we are providing inheritance so it meant that there is some sort of you know the inheritance always comes with a cost so it is it was very important for me to look at it from this very perspective um so i chose to look at it from the conjunctive water use methodology to enhance ecosystem services and sustainability of uh, aquatic ecosystems and i start with this very important slide so recently i had a, a an opportunity to attend niti aayog's uh, conference on monitoring and evaluation so one very important talk was by uh, mr anant nageshwaran who is the chief economic advisor of india he gave a very very beautiful example to understand to make us understand how important monitoring is and evaluation is so he started off of course this is not um, an example from india but what he shared was that the experience of having this example before him helped to formulate several other policies the uh, question that was being interrogated was the malnutrition um, and the death infant infant mortality rate in the us so the, he explained how the studies on infant mortality rate uh, did not confine only to that aspect it was it, it took them to the field of maternal mortality which was closely interconnected and when they talked about it they found that the maternal mortality rate uh, was not the product of that very moment of giving child birth or just before that but that the women who were giving birth had to be educated right from her teenage years to eat healthy and to have a healthy lifestyle in order to give birth to healthy children and also to be healthy herself so when they thought about it they took them over the chain to the malnutrition from the child to the mother and ultimately to the doctor who was advising these uh, women so it meant that the doctors had to have some sort of social medical medical programs in place to you know uh, talk to them about how the issues were coming down from different aspects from it, it was a top down approach and the doctors found that they didn't have the adequate advice to give i mean from the medical point of view yes they could but how could they mainstream this right so the mainstreaming or monitoring it through the life cycle was very very important and so that took them to a, a, another level that they found that the educators or the college professors and the teachers who taught these women they were the best people to educate them so it goes down a life cycle of people who are going to be involved in controlling infant mortality rate so this is a very curious example he gave to say that at, at every step monitoring was so essential that meant that the inheritance of knowledge through all these steps is very very important as well and this slide explicitly shows you can see the one which is highlighted in red and the one which is highlighted in yellow this shows that there is a very very unique relationship between ecosystems and humans in terms of the in inheritance that i explained to you you can see that there are nearly 500 million people who are currently affected in india by drought and over 20% of these live in the states which are not yet declared open defecation free so these are two different aspects drought and defecation but both are linked to what is essential for life water and that has given rise to societal issues health issues many many types of issues and the health issues you see here it is connected to how the diarrhea leads to one in five child deaths which means that we also have to look up at this chain of interconnections between society and the environment if we have to address water issues okay so this is a very important aspect and the sdg goals the sustainable development goals explicitly state that these are some important perspectives that we have to take forward when we think about water 
So I'm going to, as an ecosystem um, uh, a person who researches the ecosystem, I would like to draw your attention to tropic states. Uh, Dr. Chakraborty before me explained wonderfully about the effects of plastics and how the inheritance of microplastics over different stages uh, leads to sort of not just you know the pollution but also the legacy that we give to the future generations and I would support this view completely but look at this from the tropic state point of view it alarms us even more because at every step that there is inheritance in terms of magnification, biomagnification, bioconcentration, and the impacts are felt at ecotonal zones. So ecotonal zones are zones which are transitional zones between two ecosystems. So when we're thinking about water, we cannot just think about water, we have to think about land ecosystems also, which is a point I'm trying to make here. The freshwater, the brackish water, and the seawater, these are linked to what is known as a continuum. So there is a continuum between the land, the uh, water, and the human beings as well. And we have to understand that alteration in the ecosystem state and function will impact the human beings and the human uh, anthropogenic activities will also impact the ecosystem. So the risk of entry of any bio um, hazard is the highest at all stages. It's not just, you know, at one stage, it is the most vulnerable. And there are several ecosystems which are vulnerable in this way. And this increases at every step, but impacts are felt most downstream or at the coastal and marine areas. I come from Chennai, I'm very partial to Chennai. I've lived my whole life in Chennai. I know the kind of impacts that we face, um, you know, the impacts of pollution, uh, rivers bringing downstream, uh, the most of the pollutants entering the sea. So these are some things that have to be addressed. Uh, if we have to have a sustainable future. So basically now here we are looking at the hydrological cycle. We have talked about, um, you know, the, the, the concentration or the bioconcentration or magnification at each step. But when we visualize this in terms of the water cycle itself, we will understand that every aspect, be it the river or the stream discharges, be it the outflow, be it the inflow, be it the site runoff, or through the groundwater seepages, we are actually interacting um, in different ways with aquatic ecosystems. And it is very important also to understand from a functional point of view that there are surficial processes and there are processes which are happening at lower levels in an aquatic ecosystem. The surficial processes are, you know, up to a few meters from the surface, which is known as the epilimnion, uh, where most of the debris and the plastic litter is found. But underneath, as we go, and also Dr. Chakraborty rightly pointed out, they settle down in the sediments, which tend to stay for a much longer time. But there is always a cycling which is going on between the epilimnion and the hypolimnion at the uh, surface uh, environments and the benthic environments. And each of these environments, even if we cannot see, there are so many organisms inha inhabiting these environments, which are in constant communication or constant interaction between themselves. And the presence of more and more pollutants at the benthic environments will definitely affect even the surface environments. So the natural inorganic carbon cycle, it goes through different parts of the ecosystem and the forms of carbon tend to accumulate different um, concentrations over different periods of time. So we have to understand this from an ecosystem point of view, wastes and water are ultimately very much related and it is not confined only to surface water. It is also, um, uh, you know, the water that we don't see or which is invisible, the groundwater. So moving on, uh, we can look at e aquatic ecosystems in terms of the services that they provide. We are very well aware of the aquatic ecosystem services, one of which is fishing. Uh, it gives fisheries, supports the fisheries. It gives the provisioning services. It also gives the regulating services the water hydrological cycle itself is a regulating service in terms that it cools down the environment. We know that we experience the sea breeze and the land breeze over different periods of uh, times in the day. So these are some, uh, you know, the regulating services that the aquatic ecosystem offers. So uh, based, if we look at it from the perspective of an ecosystem, we can classify ecosystems as being part of an ecological unit, which we have already discussed at length. We also have the environmental link through the functional pathways of the biogeochemical cycling or the exchange of nutrients. Most importantly, which man actually 
impacts the most is uh, he also corresponds to aquatic ecosystems in terms of the sources of energies, right? So there, are, there I will try to explain this in further in, in the coming slides, but to just give you a simple uh, example, we actually derive energy from water and we also, you know, use energy of the water. So uh, how do we uh, derive and use? This, this are there's a slight difference between both. I will come to it. And we look at it from the biological unit as um, the previous eminent speaker has spoken about. And also we look at it from, um, you know, a regulatory point of view and a provisioning point of view as Dr. Shalini Dhyani rightly mentioned in her keynote address. And we look at it as a system of entity also, which actually changes both naturally and anthropogenically at the same time. This is something that we miss. We look at natural signals, and we look at anthropogenic signals, mostly in ma many of the scientific studies, it's looked at at separate perspectives, right? Although we start off looking at it from a natural angle, we say this is the cycle which is there in the place, this is the biogeochemical cycle that's there, and there in the place, then we tend to dominate our uh, thoughts or our uh, concentrate more on the anthropogenically mediated cycles. But why I'm trying to bring your attention back to the natural cycle, is that every ecosystem can buffer. And this buffering capacity is naturally inbuilt. And this offers it the resilience much more in magnitude than what man can offer. Man can actually impact aquatic ecosystems in different ways, but he can spoil it, but he cannot, you know, uh, uh, you know just degrade it completely. There is a resilience aspect which we have to understand. So that very subtle relationship between the natural and the anthropogenic that has to be understood. So now it brings us to a discussion on what are the issues that we have to address in modern times. So there are three important address. One address, one uh, aspect is we have to address the water availability. What is the global water availability? What is the regional, national and local? So it has to be addressed over different spatial scales and also it has to be addressed versus its use at these spatial scales as well. Second aspect we have to address, and which has become very imperative, is how do we have the, uh, you know, how, what are the strategies that we have for water reuse for different end use scenarios. Now I bring in the concept of end use scenarios because we are not always, you know, looking at it from a drinking water perspective. There is also the perspective, as I said, of the provisioning services it offers, for example, as fisheries. There is another end use aspect of water as what is it's required for irrigation. It is also used for industrial purposes. So there are different end use scenarios. And to create new water infrastructure, wherever it is required. So these are the different issues that we have to consider while we think about water management. So in this aspect, there are four different parts to addressing this question. The first part deals with the perspective of science, which is a very good perspective that we got today looking at water in different ways, right? The water quality, the quantity, the productivity of the water. So one example I've given here is looking at water productivity maps at different spatial scales. There is also the technology aspect, how to improve the quality of water. That also we have had a very good session before, uh, looking at apart from just improving the water quality, also to improve uh, through water recovery or harvesting of what fresh water that we already have. And some from the engineering perspective, with example of reservoir engineering, maintenance, using hydraulic, hydraulics to improve the, uh, you know, the asset management of water. So these are some aspects from the engineering perspective. And finally, from the managerial perspective, which binds all these aspects together from science, technology, and engineering, is to have the good or the best water use policy framework. Without this framework, the social integration of water issues falls flat. And we have to address this at the very beginning when we have these assets created or when we have the reuse um, strategies in place, we have to also be back them up with very strong policy frameworks. So now I'm going to just introduce conjunctive water use or management. So there is a very important UNESCO definition Conjunctive water, conjunctive water management is an approach to water resources management in which surface water, groundwater, and other components of the water cycle are considered as a single resource 
and therefore they are managed in the closest possible coordination in order to maximize the overall benefits from water at the short and the long term. So this is a complete definition which is very, very important for us to understand. So any approach which considers the hydrological cycle or the water cycle and conforms to somewhat the natural aspect of it is going to be the best conjunctive water use strategy available to us. And also we can look at conjunctive water usages from two different angles with its direct linkage. How do we, for example, use hydraulic connectivity or preserve the hydraulic connectivity in the natural water cycle? And the second perspective is to think about its indirect linkages with the human water use chain. So as I already mentioned, it is an integral part, therefore, of the integrated water resources management, which I'll talk about a little later. So how do we plan this conjunctive water use or conjunctive water management? So two important perspectives again. One is the use of the correct, correct technology, and there's another, the use of the appropriate technology. So there's a slight difference between using the correct and the appropriate. I'll explain with an example. So now we have a river like the Ganga, which was already uh, discussed. Now we have a river. The river has the upstream, midstream, and the downstream portions. So if we have to say, for example, there are several issues uh, the upstream people face, one of which is the water shortage issues or the drinking water shortage. If we have a reservoir system planned upstream, do we have to, what type of projects should we have downstream or midstream, which will alleviate not just the issues which are relevant to the downstream and the midstream people, but also uh, help us to enable to have the sustainability management in place, right? So for example, if we have a managed aquifer system downstream, would it be a better choice? Or if we had a series of big reservoir projects downstream, which will block the water and stop it from going to the sea, is that a better option? Right, so there are several implications for both these approaches. We can discuss that in, uh, in, um, at length in the, few, in the coming slides, but the use of damming technology, I'm trying to highlight, is that a good correct technology or is it just an appropriate technology for this period in time, right? Because CWU considers both short-term and long-term options and we have to hypothesize our work based on the kind of returns that we are looking at. And definitely a short-term return won't have much effect. Uh, maybe the movie, the population that is present at that moment in time can benefit from it, but definitely not the future generations. So what is very important for us is then to predict and manage the production and the equity issues with respect to the supply and demand of water. That is very, very important. And to address this, we have to have technical innovations for the use as well as strategizing the best use scenarios. So moving on, I give an example of the urban perspective that we have to take because um, we have grown past the perspective of urban problems and rural problems as in the modern times because it's it's the connectivity between the urban and the rural communities, although it's not very great, but there is still a better connectivity than it was in the earlier times. So one target that both the urban and the rural population together and at a transitional ecosystem, as I mentioned, the ecotonal ecosystem of the urban we can target surface water availability strategies, we can target in improving the end use efficiency strategies, and we can target the optimization of the groundwater strategies. So in relation to this, the first target, for example, there can be several approaches. One approach is to increase water availability through the use of modern water systems, such as reservoirs, or also sequentially planned sustained releases of this water. But this does not always, uh, it has not proved very successful from the social point of view. There have been so many examples from India where sharing water resource has been the greatest source of conflict. There, the end use efficiency, if we target end use efficiency, improving it or enhancing it through meteorological advisories and implementation of policies, this has been a very successful aspect because agricultural advisories have helped optimize the use of water for the farmers. Uh, this has been uh, taking place for a long time. And in the rural uh, perspective, this has been a very advantageous uh, option. If we suppose target 
groundwater use, then we need to have a policy on the number and depth of bore wells per square meter and also to prevent salt water intrusions into aquifers, especially in the coastal regions. So these two points are very, very critical. Since the cities and the rural townships are also part of the integrated model, we have to actually model the demand versus distribution, especially during the peak periods. So this is the complete idea that we can bring up for conjunctive use. Now I'm going to show us uh, some examples and discuss with you where conjunctive water use has been planned and whether it has been successful or not. One example I'm taking from the developing region of the world. There are of course several examples available from the developed countries, but I'm choosing to take one, a positive example uh, of the Yucheng Comprehensive Experiment Station from uh, which was set up by the Chinese Academy of Sciences. This is located in the district Yellow River Basin District, uh, which is also known as the North China Plain. And it's characterized, the ge geology of this place is basically characterized by fluoaquic soil and salinized fluoaquic soil in the alluvial plain. So this is the setting. So the problems that the people faced here were basically vulnerability to drought, the waterlogging of the soil, the salinization of the soil, and the wind erosion, which frequently occurred. So this has actually trickled down, as I say, there are, there are several phases of inheritance and this trickles down to managing uh, the poor water quality as well as the availability during peak periods. So now this has resulted in lower grain production. This is the impact that they took to understand how to plan the conjunctive water use. And so what they have done, you see four sets of um, um, pictures here. One of them shows the implementation of a meteorological station, which picks up the rain frequency and gives, um, you know, the people their information about the meteorological uh, changes happening there. Another is the, um, you know, the, uh, the one on your right hand side on the top is a station, which is where these meteorological uh, setup is actually, um, you know, convinced, uh, the farmers are convinced to use these advisories as also Solar panels are kept there to, you know, sort of power small, small operations, agricultural operations there. We see managed aquifer systems in the bottom and the whole area where this is located. So through use of conjunctive water use, how this was done is that planting, first of all, uh, crops like wheat, corn, cotton and soya bean, was conjunctively planned with the availability of water. That was the first point. This, what ha they wa ha wanted to do, is to rationally use the resources in such a way that plantation of crops will not deprive the soil of the water and it will not deprive the people for, of the water. And this was done not just uh, arbitrarily, but, but through modeling of water and land eco components over long periods of time. So what this has resulted in is people are acclimatized to use water when it is, it is also done in different phases and I'll show at what phases how it was done. People were acclimatized to use water at correct intervals so that they were not actually subjected to any sort of inconveniences for the communities which lived upstream as well as the communities which lived downstream. So here, I'm showing the uh, different levels in which CW was incorporated. First was a six level canal drainage system was put up in place very much with the natural systems, okay, based on the topography of the system. There. And then the water tables were kept low in the flood season and the water was stored at other times. This was the conjunctive plan that they had. It is very important, the depth to water table that has to be maintained. Right. So if it is maintained comfortably and conveniently, then the water use can may not be an issue. How this was done by using a network of about 1000 wells, which were dug 50 to 100 meters deep, and they were monitored completely. And what they found over different time periods, along with combined land management measures like leveling, improvement, social forestry practices, and integration, integrated irrigation and drainage practices that the depth to water tables increased and it supplemented uh, the supply which is necessary for planting different crops at different intervals. So this also had the co-benefit of 
lowering the salinity right so uh, this resulted in large increases in the grain yield so this is a very successful example of conjunctive water use which was planned now i am going to show uh, this picture you can see there are two black and white pictures and is one in color so the black and white pictures are of two important dams the jubak dam as well as the nap dam and these are dams which are um, actually located in west germany the one in the center it is a very important reservoir system as you can see and uh, what uh, what happened um, during world war the jubak dam as well as the nap dam these were actually bombarded by bombs and they were broken down but even in the classic uh, before the military operations even in the classic times this served as centers for conjunctive water use through their uh, presence of dams there which benefited a large population but when they were dammed it broke uh, when they were bombed it broke the dams broke and again they had to rebuild the water use scenario from the scratch what i'm trying to say is that man can build many structures we can have damming technologies in place we can have um, you know drainage uh, series of dams built at different parts of the river but this is all a socio in, uh, in terms of sociological experiments it can fail right because the uh, you know the operations the way in which humans operate change over a period of time and this reflects on whatever water systems we have created and this is going to impact all our lives at very very starting from the very smallest level to the highest impact possible the dam reservoir reservoir that you've seen was built in the modern times and this is a very well researched uh, um, reservoir which is not completely dammed it is also a place where social forestry is practiced it is also a place where ecotourism has been planned and it has taken place over the natural topography this was something that the germans came up with an innovative technology and this is an example to show that where uh, humans uh, decide come into the decision with respect to water there can be many many issues uh, and this table that i have taken from schulz paper in 1989 shows that there are different actors which will determine what the management water management expertise will be and how this is going to be implemented there can be actors such as the state ministries there can be the district administration there can be the regional water authorities and there can be the public themselves but the level of expertise that they bring into the projects or managing the water assets such as the reservoirs or the dams the decision power is fluctuating between the engineering and the scientific decision versus the political decisions and this will impact the way in which the even the modern water systems are used so it is imp important then for us to plan not just one method to um, understand water management but conjunctively use water management at different levels so here we have the need to build on the conjunctive water use methodology uh based on the hypothesis that there are results which can prove or disprove what we started off with but there are some steady state factors as i mentioned which are common and which can stay or bring back the resilience of these water ecosystems so what this basically shows suppose we take the example again of the mary um, uh, the uh, you know the managed water aquifer ecosystems downstream so there are several managed aquifer systems downstream especially in the coastal areas in tamil nadu where the water is stored underground okay whatever is is the runoff it is stored underground there they are stored at basically the high tide levels um and the low between the low tide levels in the transitional zones basically uh, we have one such example very close to pulikat where i have been working for a long time this is uh, placed on the uh, andhra pradesh side so now the question is during a transboundary operation we are collecting water downstream which is coming through the floods um, in fact the 2015 floods proved that um, the managed aquifer systems were both useful and useless at the same time because when the flood capacity increases 
there's a lot of water which is going into the sea which cannot be trapped but at the same time whatever is trapped by the managed aquifer system can help to alleviate the salinization of the aquifers right so it can bring down the salinization of the aquifers but when this is placed in areas where we have to plan for cyclonic flooding or inundation beyond a certain capacity it shows us that more engineering is required and more uh, thought is required from where to place these managed aquifer systems so that is the hypothesis that we started with that managed aquifer systems are the best ways to manage downstream water issues falls flat on several places but also it it then it proves advantages in several other ways so we have to assume the flood capacity and it, it is a coordinated effort, effect, effort between the scientists as well as the you know the engineers and the technologists to come up with more innovative solutions that is another example i wanted to give so uh, we cannot think of just in terms of logical or you know theoretical aspects but we also have to as i said because this involves a lot of social aspects we have to think of this in relational terms with the local communities what do they want what are the trade offs that they are prepared to give for example to set up a managed water aquifer system there may be the land may be required are the local communities able to take give this so sort of land or the underground land which is required for the water to be stored and are there clear cut outputs that we can consider or are they just representative so this these aspects the representative the relational the logical and the theoretical all the four should go together while planning a cwe model so from a scientific model explaining just the natural processes we go into a technical mode where the technological advancements such as the simulations or predictive models help us to study the flow characteristics at better levels and also finally the management model which combines optimization techniques of the socio economic processes as well as the scenario based factors this is very important we tend to not concentrate uh, as uh, dr shalini dani mentioned some systems which operate in north india or the other places may not be applicable to the south india so it should be a scenario based or a local based factor that has to be understood when we uh, we are suggesting appropriate resource usage and management plans for a particular place so this slide i'm not going to go into details but i can tell you there are certain factors which are very essential to plant conjunctive water use one is to manage the seasonal steep variation in the river flow over a year second one is to mitigate the effect of shortage in water supplies if there are any the third one is to we have to also develop the capability to depend on local water um, availability and the local existing supplies of water it can be through um, you know uh, uh, the tap it can be through but we have to manage along with what water we are getting through uh, uh, you know the other supplies Uh, basically we are also in chennai i think we are very much um, uh, conversant with the use of rainwater harvesting techniques that's a way that we supplement our local water resources right but we also have to consider when we are planning um, uh, a conjunctive water use scenario is to what are the problems of the high water table also as i already mentioned to you about the managed water aquifer systems and what are the issues that come with salinization through canal irrigation there is also the canal irrigation which is actually critic for bringing in large scale salinity issues to the land so land productivity and water productivity cannot be delinked as i already told you this has to be looked at in one particular perspective especially in terms of the runoff because the secondary salinization of water resources such as lakes and uh, lagoons is very very rampant also we have to use what we have to also support through our modeling efforts what is the best land use type and the crop management strategies we can come up with and how to store excess water and ensure the supply through sustained releases so these are some things that we have to understand from a social point of view we have to also investigate the population versus the demand as well as as well as its spatial temporal distribution over time and also if we can simulate the water footprints based on the different land use strategies and end use strategies this is very very important uh, aspect to plan the cwu now i actually briefly mentioned that there is a link integral link of cwu to iwrm 
and we we should understand that this link comes because there are many different uses of the finite water resources as i already mentioned irrigation uses maximum water okay but there is also the industrial and the domestic water demand which is equally relevant to the societies so if we have to understand this we come to as integral pivotal point in understanding this um, um, narrative uh, the narrative of energy and water so the interlinking of water is very very evident because as you can see in this infographic 90% of global power generation is water intensive that means to generate power we have to spend water but by 2035 global energy consumption will increase by 50% this is actually increased up to say 60 to 70% that that's a projection that's recently come out but increasing water consumption at the same time will also shoot up to 85% so how do we now manage energy water and food that is actually the crucial aspect uh, where conjunctive water use can come into action let me explain this i am taking an example of solar pumping solar pumping is thought to be very very advantageous and it is a very popular system which is being practiced at different levels in different countries as you can see here some pictures of solar pumps which are present in the uh, fields they are shown here so the advantages that are attributed to it is first of all there is it is a it uses a clean and renewable source of energy we said that producing energy is water intensive but it, it should also be clean and renewable right it is low on emissions and it's adjustable as per the water groundwater table and the ease of installation is pretty high for solar pumps and the regulation of cropping patterns the changes in the demand supply is something which is possible but as i i go back to the first point i made it is water intensive is this a water intensive technology most people would say no but i beg to differ because there are scientific studies which show that photovoltaics although they are a very easily manageable resource their uh, operation and maintenance is very heavy in terms of water it has been proven that 1 gram per meter cube meter square of sand dust if it settles on the top of the photovoltaic solar panels it needs about 7000 to 20000 liters per megawatt which is generated per week to clean this if it is does not happen the photovoltaic output or the energy generation falls by 80% further there is the effect of monsoonal effect which is very unpredictable and the end life of photovoltaics is also an unpredictable system so this decrease in the performance is guaranteed we know we have to accept that photovoltaic performance will decrease but what about its effect on the water demand right we have to understand that for example if you can see here there is a uh, picture where a truck with robotic arm cleans about 258000 solar mirrors in shams 1 which is a solar power concentrating plant uh, in abu dhabi Uh, rich countries like abu dhabi they can you know afford such robotic cleaning of its solar panels but can we do that in india is it affordable for us to do that in india so what the what the point that i'm trying to make is there are renewable water uh, energy sources which are available but are they actually convenient for conserving the water we have to have that sort of clarity when we come up with approaches and this is very much a part of the conjunctive water approach that we were talking about in place of solar oh, what is we considered small and huh? small and micro hydro power plants uh, why i'm bringing this up is that the estimated potential in india is about 15000 megawatt only 16% has been developed till now but there are so many advantages to use of small and micro hydro power projects some of these are shown here for example the use of inexpensive construction which also parallels that of the solar energy but it is not going to be a big drain on the natural capital of water so there are there can be simpler installations they can be short gestation periods to generate power and with quick financial returns more importantly it is applicable for remote and hilly areas as well as in the plains and it has a very low impact on the environment and low cost of electricity generation 
If you see Arunachal Pradesh, for example, has a to has been identified as having the best sites for using small and hydro uh, micro uh, hydropower projects. And the richest uh, uh, state in terms of this SHP potential is uh, found to be Himachal Pradesh, where which has about 547 sites with a capacity of 22,000 uh, megawatt. Right. So this is something that we have to look at. Now, Arunachal Pradesh and Himachal Pradesh can be very, very important regions where small and hydropower projects uplift even the social communities or the human communities which live in there, um, you know, the, around their ecosystem. Here I'm showing an example of some small and micro hydroelectric power projects. This uh, picture here shows one in France, which is built. So there are th three different types of HEPs. One is mini, which can produce power less than one micro uh, megawatt. There are micros which can produce power less than 100 kilowatt and uh, pico which can produce less than 10 kilowatt. Uh, you can ask what is the use of having this kind of you know small HEPs. Uh, uh, the, the point is that we are looking at sustainability from local perspectives as well as you know uh, somewhat sub-local perspectives. In that aspect, if we are sub, we can be sustainable and self-sufficient, there is no need for bigger projects which have more impacts on the environment. So from that point perspective, if we see, here you see the example of a mini HEP in Italy, which is built at uh, uh, you know, a very forested uh, environment, as you can see, without disturbing the environment through the natural flow of the streams which are there. Right? So it is going to actually not impact the environment on a large scale, it is a mini HEP. And a PICO level project, you can see this was done, there's actually a bridge across from where this scaffolding leads to a PICO level hydro project, which is set up, where water that the flood water that accumulates there is diverted into this um, setting. And this generates with a small dynamo, which is set up, it generates electricity under 5 kilowatt. But it is very useful to power, give power to the bridge, lighting the bridge and the surrounding areas during the night times. So this is one very important uh, uh, project. Another example of uh, that we are all aware of and which is coming up in recent times is using what are known as photovoltaics. Basically, these are photovoltaics which are floating on top of the water. Evaporation, which is considered highest in India very, at a very high rate and it's draining the water resources. This system, such systems are um, projected to be helpful uh, to put down the evaporation, evapotranspiration losses, as well as produce electricity at the same time. But it is not very well understood what happens to the ecosystem if they are covered with solar panels, right? That is still a study which is uh, still, uh, which requires a lot of R&D and it's still going on. But in the long term, is it sustainable? If this approach is sustainable, that has to be yet seen. This is another example of the, the two examples here rather of the micro HEP systems, which are very, very nice systems. One is a farm level micro HEP system. See, the beauty of this is that this is a community le level enterprise and the residence level or an individual level enterprise, which is a, a micro hydropower project set up to divert wastewater streams which are generated in the uh, resident level to power a dynamo, right? So here, if you see, we saw actually a regional to a sub-regional level. From a sub-regional level HEP, we came down to the mini and a PICO level project, which are basically administratively village level or a forested level approach. Here you can see they are down to even community level and individual centric level. So if we can innovate, using micro or farm level micro or a residence level micro hydro project, it can be sustainable over long periods of time. And you can see that these can be built with natural materials without taking much space or spoiling the environment. In fact, the farm level micro HEP you see here uses water which is uh, diverted from different farms. It's collected and sent through this turbine, which can help to generate electricity and power the lighting systems around this farm. So here, now the, the very important aspect that we bring in from these experiences is that we should stick to more uh, natural level approach and nature-based approach 
and more with blue green infrastructure approach which utilizes whatever infrastructure is available in a place so that we realize both short term and long term advantages okay so here the um, nbs or nature based approaches become very very important which is also a, a framework under the iucn uh, the definition of a nature based solution is very beautifully given here actions to protect sustainably manage and restore natural and modified ecosystems that address societal changes effectively and adaptively this adaptively keyword is very very important because as i said there is a natural resilience which we we should let the ecosystem uh, build on itself and help to build right so that it can simultaneously provide both human well being and also biodiversity benefits and the transition to use ecosystem services with reduced inputs of non renewable natural capital and enhanced investment in the renewable capital natural capital this is an approach which is very very central to using nature based solutions so the long term effects of course are that we are looking at preservation of ecosystem quality and ecosystem based resilient development as i have discussed on the short term the noticeable change in pollution they improved the psychosocial and health conditions as well as cost effectiveness these are the characteristics of a well planned nature based solution um, in in a given area but the most important thing that nature based solution offers is sustainable development and positive inheritance for the future generations so this uh, slide here shows some of these aspects with respect to the aquatic ecosystem especially the river and ecosystem as you can see the there is one place where i would like to draw your attention to it is the midstream the connecting rivers to flood plain and aquifers ideology is very very important because this is where many problems begin right one thing is use of slope cultivation or uh, erosion prevention by naturally engineering naturally natural substances or engineered materials to prevent downstream flooding and to use the forested landscapes for regeneration so these are some upstream nature based solutions which are perfectly feasible and perfectly possible and it has been practiced over several generations the ones in the downstream like creating riparian buffers to have wetlands conservation and ecosystem eco restoration as dr inbakandan had shared before and also to use water and wastewater harvesting techniques Uh, reuse techniques and improving infiltration and bioretention these are very perfect nature based solutions which are applicable for downstream but if you see the midstream connecting rivers to flood plains and aquifers this is where we fall short many many places because the connectivity between the rivers with the flood plain is blocked due to the heavy urbanization trends that we notice and also the connectivity of the rivers to the aquifers not letting enough time for infiltration or percolation and you know recharge of the aquifers that is something that is um, a, a very crucial aspect which needs more and more research and more and more managerial aspects we have to concentrate on it from the nature based aspect so finally i am i am showing here how supporting conjunctive water use and conjunctive managed water management measures can help to achieve several sdg goals so we we all know that there are several sdg goals um, uh, and each of it is a very very critical role but the use of conjunctive water use and management can help to um, you know uh, in, in different levels help to uh, satisfy hunger to have you know no poverty situation because if the water distribution is equitable everybody is going to be able to afford decent living conditions and economic growth and there will be responsible consumption and production if we have a conjunctive water use system and plan which assures water equity and distribution to everybody so also we preserve from an ecosystem perspective the water resources the water life below water that is the fisheries as well as the life on land the cropping and the agricultural uh, fields so this actually helps us to realize the true natural capital and also to pass it on to the future generation and this will be the true inheritance without tax or without cost so if we are able i know it's a very difficult journey to plan this but we have to think of different innovations and different ways in which we can achieve this so that we no longer end up with an inheritance tax 
but only inheritance profits. So with that, I thank you all for your uh, attention today and for the opportunity to discuss some of the most important case studies and issues related to water management with you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for the well-structured presentation that is uh, very informative. Uh, participants, if you have any uh, queries regarding the topic or uh, regarding the lecture, you can uh, directly interact with the speaker or you can sh share through the chat box. Actually, I just want to have one question. Actually, it's a very beautiful presentation and uh, you have uh, interlinked everything uh, in a very informative manner. Uh, that, that's what I want to highlight first. And uh, uh, it is the right time. We, uh, your presentation uh, uh, is almost, uh, now we, uh, the, uh, even the parliamentary committee is talking about the river linking project and all. Uh, uh, based on your observation, uh, can you highlight something on that? What will be the merits and demerits of this if it is implemented? Yes. Um, so um, I have a PhD student who is working with me on interlinking aspects, but we are very cautious about this. Uh, as I already explained to you, first of all, we need to, when we, we are scoping a region, we have to see what are the local water resources which are available and whether they can be managed to make we can manage them to make it sustainable. So the, the community structure sometimes also gives us clues because there are communities which take very less water and they can use it very sustainably. We have to look at these indigenous ways in which people use water, indigenous ways in which they manage water. But there are communities which tend to use it more without even thinking about where the supply is coming from and what is the, you know, the level that they can use. This is typically typical of the urban areas, I would say. So when we are scoping uh, for water interlinking, it is going to majorly cater only to urban populations. Whatever we say, it is actually something that the uh, you know people in uh, power they look at it as prestigious to cater to people who uh, uh, live in the urban areas, but it it is not necessary for people who are living in rural environments. This is what we see during our ground level surveys. One aspect is another aspect that we have to plan. This is like an asset which is going to be there forever, maybe through several life uh, histories of people who are going to be in that place. So constructing a dam or having canals in place, interlinking rivers is going to be easy to achieve in modern times. But is the legacy true? One problem is salinization. And another problem I can give you example in Hyderabad, Karnataka region in um, Karnataka, where we are studying, there is a very acute problem of arsenic contamination in the groundwater. So here, if we are going to, you know, have uh, surface water diverted from some other place, and it is going to be also, there are also recharge pits which are planned alongside the canal system or the interlinking uh, rivers system that we are thinking about. Um, Tungabhadra, for example, there, are, there is a lot of area around this Tungabhadra river where these managed aquifer systems are also planned. But if we are bringing water, water is not going to be just the rainwater which is flowing through or just the river water which is flowing through. It is going to be a combination of all the water resources in one place which is going to be diverted to another place. So are we going to bring in contaminants from one place to another place? This is a serious perspective that we have to argue about. And this is something that I tell my students. What can you ensure the best water quality in the destination? Maybe at the start, you can. But as water flows through the system, where it ends up, can we actually you know, uh, say that this is the best end use scenario in terms of water quality also? Because arsenic, for example, is a very difficult contaminant to manage. So are, are we going to compound the problem by actually, you know, addressing demand issue? Are we going to compound the problem of water quality issue? So these are some perspectives which required very important insights. We cannot look at it just at, you know, uh, as an engineering uh, solution or just as, um, you know, the new water centric uh, management plan aspect. But we also have to look at it from the environmental sustainability aspect. So, so I think in that it is like uh, bio innovation. 
uh, yeah. like bio invasion it may be a chemical invasion to the other end yes, definitely that is also an issue because it's going to bring in uh, new species from where they were not present to another place where they can be you know the alien species or invasive species especially for fishes there are lots of studies even in ganga and the several other uh, rivers which have proven that alien species in invasion has destroyed the native ecosystems in uh, in the given place in the destination so yes uh, these are some issues which are which need more uh, de deliberation thank you ma'am uh, from my side uh, before implementing or if implementing stringent monitoring mechanism is also required after ensuring the quality or the necessary quantities available then only we can think about the transferring the water so definitely the, madam that, that is the actually the crux of conjunctive water use so because we cannot look at it only from one aspect we have to look at it uh, not in terms of making the infrastructure but also monitoring and evaluating it so that we get best use out of this uh, whole approach it is very important we don't monitor only water resources we should monitor the adjacent ecosystem the land ecosystems uh, through which these water resources are uh, you know uh, conveyed so this is a very very important aspect as you mentioned monitoring evaluation in fact actually is more um, uh, costly in terms of the time as well as the you know the uh, financial uh, implications considering the infrastructure uh, planning itself or establishment itself Uh, Ma'am, actually, I have one more thing. Actually, one of your uh, slides she, uh, show, said that uh, there are four phases of uh, water usage. That is, uh, science-based, uh, engineer, technology-based, engineering-based, and management-based. Uh, being a marine biologist, actually, I am just raising this question. As you said, uh, even the end user is uh, part of the fishery and fishery-related thing. Also, it is there. Whether when we are talking about the managerial point of view, is it there is any proper framework? Uh, there are a lot of uh, policies and frameworks are available uh, uh, in each department and state and all. Uh, that, uh, that is uh, very sure. But uh, uh, in the modern times of some kind of these problems, according to that, these policies are uh, updated, whether for the end users like fisheries and fishery related population, whether these frameworks are updated for the beneficial of those people? Yeah, so uh, if you're talking about the link between, you know, in, in, uh, from a coastal zone perspective, if we are talking about the link between freshwater and uh, brackish water and the place where it joins the sea, I would say that there are very, very less policies which are available right now to deal with the problems in the downstream area. This is something that I'm also researching. And uh, Pulikat is one example that I've been looking at. Apart from this, if we see the Kerala wetland systems, they are much better managed coastal zones than if we consider what we have on the east coast of India. We are also studying actually Odisha and parts of uh, Chilka Lake Lagoon for, uh, you know, from the managerial aspect. I would say we don't have that very specific policies which help us to, you know, preserve the fisheries aspects of these coastal ecosystems. It's, it's not there. But if we have a system, of course, the systems itself are different. For example, if we consider Pulikat and Chilka, they are more a coastal lagoon ecosystem. Whereas on the west coast, we have more like an estuarine or a creek ecosystem where water is diverted through different uh, regions before, you know, uh, it uh, approaches the land. So, uh, uh, so uh, before it approaches the sea. So in that way, there is also some sort of purification that is happening on the way. And also the fisheries are based on the level of salinities which are present at these different regions of the estuaries. So supportive community participation is more effective there, which helps to sort of resolve some problems related to pollution downstream. But in the, in the, in the uh, place of coastal lagoon system, the natural resilience is very amazing because uh, uh, I, I, even in you know, the absence of policies, I have seen that for 2015, I have a few publications. In 2015, what happened during the flood event in Chennai, there was so much flood flow through Aranya River into the Pulikat Lake, and which actually gave rise to diatom blooms. So we are actually aware of issues of harmful algal blooms. And since I was uh, fortunate enough to do my research at that point of time, I had collected some samples and I was also able to estimate that the salinity had gone down by 40%. 
So this is something that is a very important uh, thing to consider. When it had gone down, still these bloom conditions did not affect the whole eco uh, ecosystem. So there was some sort of uh, you know sequestration that was happening in the sediments. There was some sort of uh, biogeochemistry which helped the lagoon to regain its brackishness and also to you know preserve its natural ecosystem services. So the fisheries were not affected at all. Uh, Pulikat, as you know, is um, rich in prawns. Actually, the prawn landings did not decrease, and the system has has you know since in the five years since the flood, it has actually regained back its ecosystem services. So that is something very, very amazing that we are looking at from a resilience point of view. That is why I highlighted both the natural resilience as well as the anthropogenic impacts. We have to look at it in uh, two different uh, parts of the scale and try to balance it, right? And then come up with management solutions. Maybe it is not effective what we use in the East Coast would be applicable to the West Coast. So these are some considerations that we have to look up. But policies, as you say, are very, very less, I would say. Thank They're you. not existing. Yeah. If policies are there also, implementation is very tough. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. But we have to have implementation stitched into the policy itself. Then it becomes very effective. So that, that is the, you know, um, uh, we nowadays we come up with uh, strategic policies or induced based policies where we are targeting something targeted policies this is the, actually the framework that is coming up so we are targeting an issue and we are uh, having policies set up for that target um, you know to achieve that end use and so that uh, implementation also becomes part of this but community participation and initiation is a very very important aspect which is going to have um, which is going to tell us how effective these policies are. Uh, what about your opinion on subsurface dikes or other ground dam uh, so that it can prevent uh, that uh, huge base flow? Uh, so it, will it work out in um, uh, recharging or uh, uh, harnessing the resources? Thank you for that question. Um, this is exactly the managed aquifer system I was talking about. So managed aquifer systems are, uh, you know, uh, being seen as very good resources to store water, to prevent uh, salinization of the soil. Uh, to some extent, it will work if they are actually well designed and well placed in the proper place. Otherwise, it is of no use at all. Because even if we, if we have designed structures which can withstand, uh, withstand floods, so of known uh, intensities, there can be another flood which will, you know, supersede all these flood events. And then the managed aquifer system is very difficult to bounce back. So it has to be actually planned well. If water underground storage is planned well, then it can happen. The example that I showed in China, this cannot be actually restricted only to downstream places. It has to begin from upstream. There have to be strategically placed wells which can allow for infiltration and also uh, retention over longer periods of time so that our man aquifer systems are well managed over all the points, not just the downstream, but also from upstream and midstream. So the connectivity between the aquifer systems, that is also very essential to have a successful system in place. So their connectivity between aquifers is lost because of many issues. One thing I can uh, tell you from an urban perspective, Bangalore was actually a um, very drought prone region and Kemper Gowda, the ruler of Bangalore, he built a series of canals, uh, canal systems which are interconnected and they were actually water storing systems which are the lakes of Bangalore today that we see. And the interconnection between these lakes had a cascading effect. So whatever was, you know, Bangalore is a slopey area. It is a mountainous or a hilly region. So there was a natural flow of uh, water through a gradient, which was connected. The lakes were interconnected and they seemed like the best conjunctive water use plan, which was available for several generations. But now due to siltation, due to urbanization and, uh, you know, the construction uh, activities that are going around over several years now, in the past few decades, this interconnectivity is lost. Because of that, you can see increased incidence of urban flooding events in Bangalore. So the change from a rural or a urban environment to an urban environment brings with its own challenges. The breaking up of 
not just the connectivity between the cascading river systems uh, to manage surface water, but also these systems were connected to the underground aquifer system that has also gone down. Because of that, there are several parts of Bangalore facing acute water shortages. So these are actually interconnected issues. So when we plan something, it has to be, you know, circular. We call it circular economy. So it's also the management itself should be a circular um, management plan. Then it works. Now, uh, what about wastewater recharge? Uh, if you are uh, after uh, treating at the optimum level or possible level, if you are uh, doing uh, using that water for recharge, is there any uh, that guidelines this for, uh, before recharging the water should be levels or contaminant level within that? Is there any guidelines are there? Or otherwise, if you, if you are doing this, uh, 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 we actually distorted the actual thing under the ground uh, aquifer quality may get it deteriorated because without doing in scientific way if you are doing is there any uh, that, uh, policy not policy any uh, that checklist so uh, contaminant level within that we can use it for aquifer research is there any yeah so basically uh, there is a categorization of uh, induced uh, scenarios for water which is given by cpcb we are aware of it so uh, if uh, water that is actually harvested from either wastewater or rainwater uh, comes to a specific um, you know water quality level in terms of ph in terms of tds in terms of salinity in terms of the presence of you know contaminants such as phenols or uh, you know volatile organics or uh, other organic compounds it can be categorized into different best use scenarios class a for example is designated best use for drinking water what I would uh, say is that the other, there are other classes, B, C, D, and E, to which uh, water, these water, that is the water harvested from wastewater, can be used. Okay, the recovered water can be used, for example, for industrial applications. It can be used for irrigation to some extent, where if our if the TDS is brought below a certain uh, value. This critical value also has to be ascertained using the local soil conditions. So one example I can give you, uh, first of all, I should own that there are no straight policies available right now. Although we have the categorization from CPCB and it is uh, understood that the water has to meet those standards, we still are, from the implementation point of view, it is not very strictly implemented. There was actually a very nice project uh, in Bangalore. Uh, it's called the Polar Water Project, which collected water from the city Wastewater, basically, I'm talking about. We have decentralized wastewater treatment systems in Bangalore. The water from those uh, plants, they were diverted to um, adjacent fields in Kola, which surrounded the urban region. So this is the urban region that I brought in. So water from these, uh, from the city, wastewater, was the idea was to treat this wastewater and give it for irrigating about several acres of land in Kola. At first, this so it seemed to be working out, but what happened was that this water, which uh, was conducted through underground system of pipes, which was taken to Kolar at several places at non -point, through non-point source entry and as well as point source entry, industrial waste went into this water. So, which became uh, to, towards the end, we had a chance to go on a field survey and you know test this water. Towards the end, if you see the heavy metal concentration was very, very high, which meant that it was the place where the lake, there's a small lake receiving this wastewater and from where, you know, the uh, there were several interconnected systems through which they were to be distributed to the fields. The receiving lake was heavily contaminated with heavy metals, which meant that it is, we need a strict policy at every level of, uh, you know, the entry of the water. It has to be evaluated, monitored, and the levels have to be brought down. But is it practically possible? It's, it's not very efficient through just chemical treatment methods to achieve this. So in that aspect, the wetland system is very much a boom. The natural wetland systems, maybe we have to divert some of this water through natural as well as, you know, uh, man-made wetland systems from where they are conducted through again to an arterial channel, which will disperse this to the uh, agricultural fields for irrigation. But that system is still not in place. And it takes a lot of time to create this sort of blue-green infrastructure. 
and blue green infrastructure also has to be maintained in modern times because it's a rapidly even kolar if you see is not just a rural uh, ecosystem right now it is a pretty urbanized environment so these sort of the way that we are experimenting with wastewater recovery is very very positive but uh, how it will impact the environment we have to understand and make some changes particularly by using nature based solutions then it becomes a very efficient system thank you ma'am thank you ma'am thank you for the wonderful session that you have given the wonderful discussion session also it was very informative ma'am uh, but with this uh, we would like to end the uh, technical session the second technical session of the day uh, thank you so much ma'am for being with us and uh, thank you participants uh, for uh, giving the queries and uh, having the doubts cleared in the session itself now i would like to thank uh, my university yeah. for uh, uh, inviting me and giving me the opportunity to present i look forward for more interactions exactly exactly actually i think uh, dr bakya lakshmi ma'am she is working on uh, that water aquifers for a uh, long years so hope she got an idea so uh, definitely there will be some collaborative thing we will yes, yes, yes. and thanks so, to sure sure we are looking for that that's the thing and thanks for the both the speakers i think both their uh, presentation is very informative and uh, more interactive even i have a lot of questions in my mind so that that due to the time constraint we are unable to give more um, time to the participant to interact with that and thanks a lot to the dr chakravarty as well as to dr harini thanks a lot ma'am thank you did you just announce about the tomorrow's yes, uh, session yeah. yes uh, dear participants tomorrow there will be one technical session i'll be sharing just now the technical session of tomorrow's uh, 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 tomorrow will be handled by uh, dr r selvagumar associate professor in nanobiotechnology head and department of biotechnology and nanobiotechnology psc institute of advanced studies uh, on the topic methods and challenges in identification quantification and the fate analysis of emerging contaminants in water samples the time will be the same and the link is also will be the same uh, the participants can be joined by tomorrow 10:30 am Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.